Welcome to the lecture on crop modelling. This is part of the subject Agricultural Technologies ALM 207 which is offered at the institution of NMIT as part of the agricultural degree. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. Modelling means many things to many people and in this lecture we're going to give an overview of some of these concepts. I'd like you to stop this video and go on to the URL link on the screen, also found on Moodle, and have a quick look at Farm Sim, which is a program which simulates farming. This is an example of a model. In this lecture we are going to give an overview or introduction to modelling. Here we will cover some of the basic concepts that you need to know when using models. We will look at mechanistic versus empirical, empirical modelling in crop modelling. We will look at some advantages and disadvantages of modelling. We will look at one simple crop estimation model and a few case studies. A very generic definition of modelling is a model is not a real world but merely a human cons construct to help us better understand this real world. In general, all models have information input, an information processor, and an output of expected results. I'm going to spend the next few slides introducing different types of models. These different types of models not only apply to crop, but to other forms of modeling. They include conceptual models, physical models, mathematical and statistical models, and a visualization model. Let us begin by examining a conceptual model. This is a quantitative model that helps us highlight important connections in real world systems and processes. They are used as a first step in the development of more complex models. Please refer to the following URL link for examples and details of conceptual models. Please read through this information. On this webpage you will find some examples of what conception models are. Please familiarise yourself with the red sunset and blue skies model and the significant carbon taxes example of a mental model. A physical model is a system that can be easily observed and manipulated and which have characteristics similar to key features of more complex systems in the real world. Mathematical and statistical models are perhaps a more traditional mental image of a model. These involve solving relevant equation or equations of a system or characterising a system based upon its statistical par parameters such as the mean, mode, variance or regression coefficients. Mathematical models include analytical models and numerical models. Statistical models are useful in helping identify patterns and underlying relationships between data sets. Please follow the following URL link, also found on Moodle, to see examples of mathematical and statistical models. Please familiarise yourself with these examples. The webpage on the screen shows an example of a mathematical model and an example of a statistical model. Please through, read through these examples and identify the difference between the two types of models. A visualisation model can be a direct link between data and some graphic or image output, or can be linked in a series with other types of model, so to convert its output into a visual, visually useful format. This is very useful for conceptualising large data sets. In the next few slides, we will familiarise ourselves with some important aspects of model. Let's start with units and conversion factors. To avoid confusion and errors, a standard system is recommended when using and developing models. One such system, developed by the Royal Society in 1975, is the International System of Units, or SI. In this system, we clarify mass as kilograms, length as metres, and time as seconds. 
Dynamic models of crop growth may describe time in days. It is important to uniform our models, otherwise confusion may arise. For example, if you were measuring a single leaf photosynthetic rate, you may have a unit of mix per carbon dioxide per meter squared per leaf per second. And you may wish to relate this to your yield, which is expressed in units of kilogram per dry matter per hectare. The issue with this is that you are mixing milligrams with, with kilograms for mass and square meters with hectare for area. Up until now, all the descriptions that we have talked about in this lecture on modeling were very generic. Now we will move on to specifically discussing crop and plant modeling. There tends to be two types of model that are used in crop and plant modeling, dynamic and empirical. We will start by describing dynamic. Dynamic models are used to, uh, in an aid of prediction. Models are conjectures that have the best survived the unremitting criticism and scepticism that are the inter integral part of the scientific process, as quoted by Thornbury and Johnson. Dynamic models are used to increase the knowledge in this area of science. They are used also for applied and or strategic modelling. That is where you use the model to increase the efficiency or improve the environment. It is important that observational data is coupled with a theory or hypothesis or conceptual scheme that corresponds to this data. This is a very important underlying assumption in plant and crop modelling. So let us look at how these models work. A continual interaction between the hypothesis and the observational data is produced and an outcoming of processing in understanding or efficiency. In dynamic modelling, mathematics plays an important role, but it is important for us to understand this role and the boundaries of mathematics. A model often exams, examines both quantitative and qualitative aspects of a problem. While theory and experimentation are usually described by mathematics, emphasis should be on the ideas and the hypothesis of the theory and not the contributed by mathematics. It is important to see mathematics as a tool or a language enabling the biological scientist or agriculturalist to express their ideas and or hypotheses. There are three areas of wisdom that usually enable the construction of agricultural and horticultural modelling. There is the traditional knowledge. This is how farming is conducted. Then there is scientific knowledge, based on many hours of rigorous research. And thirdly, there is congestion or guesswork. This is required where a novel solution is required to complete the modelling. In dynamic modelling, often hierarchical systems are present. That is because plant biology tends to have many organisational levels. For example, you have a crop which is, uh, constitutes many plants. Each of those plants have organs and tissues and cells. Within the cells you have organelles and macromolecules, molecules and atoms. Of these hierarchical levels, each level has its own language, that is, it's unique to that level. Each level is an integration of items from the lower levels. Successful operations of a given level requires lower levels to function correctly, and vice versa. The higher levels provide the constraints, boundary values and driving force, we mean inputs and outputs here, to the lower levels. On descending to a lower level, generally both spatial and temporal scales become smaller. That is, the components are physically smaller and the processing time is faster. The second large group of models used in crop modelling is called empirical models. They are di direct descriptions of observational data, for example like tidal data. 
Any mathematical relationship used in these models are usually unconstrained by physical laws. A physical law is such laws like the laws of thermodynamics. The empirical model describes a level of behaviour, or observational data, by terms of the attribute alone, without regard to the biological theory. In summary, an empirical thought data represents the data and no new information is required. An example of an empirical model is the saying, red sky at night, shepherd's delight. This has been used in the planning of many farming activities and picnics. Here is another example of a simple empirical model. It is describing the observational data of crop yield to the level of fertiliser. This model contains no information about the original data, the mechanism in the response, or why the plant is behaving in the observed manner. The data can be fitted to what is called a three-parameter rectangular hybola. On the screen you will see an arrow which indicates the maximum yield. In this particular model it is describing the maximum yield or the maximum crop yield at, at any level of a given nitrogen fertiliser. Now I'm going to talk through how to use a simple model of crop estimation. This simple model was developed by DPI Victoria and instructions on the model can be found on the website in the URL link presented. This will also be on Moodle. Stop the lecture now and read through Estimating Crop Yields, a brief guide uh, developed by DPI and you can reach this by the URL link on the slide before or via Moodle. Please refer to Moodle Simple Model Excel Sheet for an electronic copy of this Excel sheet. In the first page of this Excel sheet, I have detailed the model instructions. Step 1. Select an area that is representative of the paddock. Using the same type of measuring rod or tape measure, measure out an area of 1 metre squared and count the number of heads or pods of this crop. It is important that you stick to the measurements, otherwise biased in the model will be introduced. It is also important that you select an area that is representative. If the area of crop is too thin or in an area of poor nutrients, then it will not be representative of the entire crop. Now we move on to stage two of the model. Once you have collected one representative area of your paddock, you need to repeat this five times. This allows proper replication of your plots, resulting in an average number of heads for your plot. In the third stage of the model, you will need to count the number of the grains in at least 20 heads of, of per uh, grain if you're measuring wheat. On your slide now you will see an image of a head. Each of these um, kernels contain grains. You will remove these and count the number of grains across each head and record in the data sheet set out as you can see on the screen. It is important that you also record other information such as the date, the crop that you're taking the information from, which paddock it comes from, and recording climatic variants, like if it was wet that day or windy, can also be very important. You may obtain such a data set, showing the number of grains per head in at least 20 heads of wheat. Once you have collected this data, you will be able to calculate the mean. In Excel, there are simple algorithms that enable you to do this. You can use the Excel example sheet supplied on Moodle and double click on the cell, like so. Once you've collected all the grain numbers, you can then calculate the average. Excel can help you put together the simple algorithm to do this. 
If you double click on the cell, you will find the formula presented at the top of the Excel sheet. The formula for average is typing the, the equal sign, typing the word average, open bracket, and then selecting the columns that you wish to include, followed by a closed bracket. You then press the enter key, and this will calculate the mean for you. In the final stage of this model, DPI compiled a table which enables you to convert your grain number to a grain weight. This is required for the crop model. In our theoretical example, we were using wheat as the crop type. Therefore, we will use the conversion weight of 3.4. Now we've collected all the data, we are able to insert this data into our model and thus estimate wheat yield. Let us talk through all the inputs. The number of heads per square metre was the first input collected. This is called input A in the model. This was the number of heads we calculated in our five plots and it was the average of these five plots that we used. In our example on the screen, we will assume there were 220 heads per square metre. Secondly, we collected a number of heads and calculated the number of grains. This allowed us to calculate the average, which in our example was 24. This was input B. Input C we can determine from the data collected of A and B. Therefore, the number of grains per square metre is A times B. In our example, this is 220 times 24. This gives us a total value of 5,280 grains per square metre. From input C, we can calculate the yield per square metre. This is input C, or 5,280 in our example, divided by 100 times the average weight. This average weight can be obtained from table 1. In our example, this works out at 5,280 divided by 100 times 3.4, which is the average weight for our wheat. This gives us a value of 179.52 grams per square metre. Once you have yield in grams per square metre, you can then convert this to tonnes per, per hectare by dividing 100. Therefore, output C is divided by 100 to give output T, or 1.79 tonnes per hectare. This is your estimated yield. The Excel sheet on Moodle gives you these um, calculations in the spreadsheet. Please have a think about the assumptions that this model is based on. Please make a note of these assumptions as part of your lecture notes. Also, make a note of the advantages and disadvantages that this simple model may have in your agricultural enterprises. Please refer to Moodle or your handout for a list of questions on the paper of Crop Modelling for the Australian Canola Industry, a review. This is a paper written by Robertson and Kirkard for the 19th Australia Research Assembly on Brassicas as a conference paper. These questions will help you to establish the learning outcomes required of this documentation and hopefully gives you an industry specific case study for Australia and canola. Please pause the lecture now so that you can attempt the questions and read the case study. The second case study I'd like to you to examine is the My Agricultural Information Bank. This is one page of A4 writing on models developed by the My Agriculture Information Bank. The task for this case study would be to make a set of notes on the six types of modelling described on this web page. The URL link is on the screen and also listed on Moodle for your convenience. 
In the previous topic on agricultural technologies, we were looking at sensing. If you are to couple a sensing system on farm with modelling, it greatly assists with your predictions and the uh, increased op optimization of your farming system. This may be how some of the future modelling components are undertaken, collecting real-time data from your farm environment so that you can optimise your responses to that specific climate. There are some generic advantages to crop modelling. For example, this is a technique that allows new scientific insights. It offers the potential for benchmarking and yield prediction to industries. When crop modelling is coupled with sensing technology, the ability to improve for accurately and specific enterprises significantly increases. Crop modelling has the potential to increase economic outputs. Like all technologies, modelling is associated with a number of disadvantages. The predominant disadvantage is that it is often subject to error. There are many reasons for this error, but some of these include that you need to understand how your crop responds when it is part of a complex ecosystem. The crop response is often subject to hierarchical systems. Therefore, you need to understand each of the level of these hierarchical systems. This presents difficult technical challenges, particularly at the lower levels, the macro and micro levels of the system. And finally, the user needs to understand the assumptions underpinning the model. If the user is an agricultural representative who has not been able to develop the model, then there may be a knowledge gap here not realised. And so it is important when you are using the model to familiarise yourself with these uh, assumptions. I came across some interesting quotes about models, which I thought were useful to show some perspectives in this area. George Box stated that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Einstein made several comments about models. One, make your theory as simple as possible, but no simpler. And two, for every complex question, there is a simple and a wrong solution. So to conclude, I hope you have had an overall understanding of the concepts underpinning modelling. I hope that you are able to describe different models used in agriculture. I hope you understand the advantages and the disadvantages of modelling, particularly with respect to the assumptions of that model. And I hope you are able to construct and use a simple model, as in the example we have described here. Certainly there is a lot of exciting opportunities for crop modelling and this is an area of technology that will advance. This brings us to the end of this lecture.